Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming uh, to this event uh, on behalf of Romans Bookstore. Uh, my name is Gilbert, and I'll be your host. Um, yeah, so we are doing a virtual event here with Tim DeRoche and Gloria Romero in conversation with Jill Stewart, discussing a fine line how most American kids are kept out of the best public schools. Uh, we're so excited and grateful that our bookstore can continue, continue to bring authors and their works to our community during this uncertain time. Now, Romans Live will continue to host virtual events, and you can learn more about them on our website, as well as our social media. Our next event is tomorrow, Monday, May 18th at 6 p.m. with Dr. Moira Dolan as she discusses her book, Boneheads and Brainiacs. For regular updates on upcoming events, please feel free to subscribe to our newsletter. Now this evening's virtual, uh, or this afternoon's virtual event will end with a Q&A. So to submit a question, please use the ask a question button, which is down over yonder, the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, please click the like button. We'll try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Also, if you'd like to purchase a copy of tonight's featured book, you can click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen. Uh, the link will direct you to our website where you continue continue uh, your checkout process. Um, uh, we uh, Romans is currently open for curbside pickup as well. So if you're in the area, um, we can always offer that. Uh, now, with that being said, uh, let me uh, introduce our uh, speakers for this evening. Um, great. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Gilbert. Uh, so, uh, Jill Stewart is the managing editor, uh, is, for, is the former managing editor of the LA Weekly and a former executive director of the Coalition to Preserve LA. She is an experienced TV and radio commenter, having appeared on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, KPCC, KCRW, and BBC Radio. Uh, for seven years, she was a Metro reporter with the LA Times, where she focused on urban affairs, poverty, affordable housing, the environment, and government. She currently teaches journalism at Chapman University and serves as a freelance editor, analyst, and strategist. Uh, Gloria Romero is an education reformer. Uh, in 2001, she was elected uh, to the 24th Senate District of California, representing East Los Angeles and Eastern Los Angeles County until 2010. She was chosen by her peers to serve as Senate Democrat, Democratic Caucus Chair and as Senate Majority Leader, the first woman to ever hold that leadership position. And she has also served as chair of the Senate Education Committee. Uh, Tim DeRoche is a consultant and a writer based in Los Angeles. For 20 years, he has worked with clients in K-12 education, serving public school districts, charter school networks, and other nonprofits. He has written for Quillette, Education Week, the LA Business Journal, and the Washington Post. He is an alumnus of both the international consulting firm McKenzie & Company and the PBS Producers Academy. His first book, The Ballad of Huck and Miguel, a retelling of Huck Finn set on the Los Angeles River, was featured on CBS Sunday morning. So that is our, our, our everybody for this evening. Um, I'm gonna pass it off to, uh, to Jill Stewart right now so she can give us a little bit. Thank you everybody for being here. Please take it away. Okay, we're gonna go to a video soon, I believe, but first I'll give a little bit of a, a background on the book. Um, I'm gonna read something from the back uh, a leaf of the book from Tony Miller, former Deputy Secretary of Education under President Obama, and he says it's a must read for education reform. Leaders, policymakers, parents, anyone who believes that a child's zip code should not prevent him or her from accessing the best education that a school district offers. And I'll give you a hint about the book and how it ends. Uh, uh, the fantastic Tim DeRoach suggests a number of ways for the public to start suing the government to get this rolling. So that's just a hint about where this, this is not a, this is a lovely book filled with beautiful maps, but it is not a, um, it is not a safe book. It's a wonderfully interesting, daring book. That's it. All right, thanks, Jill. Um, I'm so grateful for Romans for hosting this event. You know, we were hoping to be uh, in the store today um, with many of you uh, in the store celebrating the launch of this book um, and talking about these difficult issues. Um, but really, this is a, a, a great way to do this given the pandemic, and um, we're just so grateful uh, for Romans. And one of the advantages 
Uh, one of the few advantages of this pandemic is that our, our launch party right now is accessible to folks who are not in Los Angeles. So uh, I have very fond recollections of our launch of our first book at the last bookstore um, in downtown LA. So very happy to have you all here. This book um, is something that I've been working on for about seven years since I met Gloria. Um, and uh, really, Gloria and I just started with this kernel of curiosity. You know, we knew, I've lived in Silver Lake and Mount Washington here in LA, and there are some very elite public schools in there, those areas. And um, I know that people pay, um, we knew that people paid quite a bit to live in the zones for those schools. And we started just with this basic curiosity of, well, what is the legal basis? So if, 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 if a family, if a young family is a taxpaying member of the district, a constituent of the district, um, and they live within walking distance of one of these schools, but they're on the wrong side of one of these lines, how, what is the district's legal um, um, basis for excluding them from saying, from turning them away from that school? So that one bit of curiosity led us down a rabbit hole, led me down a rabbit hole of research in which I just uncovered surprise after surprise after surprise about how these things actually work in the real world. And I learned that, you know, I'd been working in education reform off and on for 20 years, but really there were lots of things going on that I was unaware of. And at a certain point, uh, it became clear that there was just this great untold story um, and that, um, that I could tell a story that would be fun and fascinating to read about American democracy and about public education, um, but that might also um, um, generate some interest and change. So what I'm going to do right now is just quickly, uh, our friend Zach created this great video, which is kind of a summary of the book. And so we'll just pay a few minutes of that video and you can kind of get a feel for um, what we're talking about. And then, then Jill, I'm, I'm sure, is going to have some, some good, tough questions for us. Oh, so let me do this just a second. Share screen, okay. A person's zip code shouldn't determine their educational destiny. I'm Tim DeRoche. I'm the author of A Fine Line, How Most American Kids Are Kept Out of the Best Public Schools. The book is really about these policies that assign children to schools based on where they live. And specifically, I'm shining a light on attendance zones, which are the lines drawn by a district that determine who goes to which school and who gets preferential enrollment at the best public schools. To me, this book goes to really the essence, the heart of what I saw as a policymaker, as a legislator in Sacramento. It helps us to connect the dots. This is a very uh, exciting hearing for the Senate Education Committee. I'm retired California State Senator Gloria Romero. I was actually the very first woman to ever achieve the leadership position, being elected to be the majority leader. And also I was on the education committee for most of the 14 years that I served. Gloria Romero is a hero of mine. I was so honored when she agreed to write the afterwards of the book. She fought for kids when she was in the Senate. She was always willing to speak truth to power. Is it right to have these artificial lines drawn by some unidentified bureaucrat that this is the front door through which you can enter, or this is a door that says closed and you must go elsewhere? Most people have heard of district boundaries, legislatively determined boundaries of a school district, but what plays an outsized role in most American families' lives are these attendance zones, which are the lines drawn by the district staff showing which kids are directed to which schools. And these lines really only have meaning for the best schools. It keeps the population of that school separate from the broader community of the district. These lines have existed for decades in our state, in our nation, and it's about time that there is a spotlight on these little fine lines that people never see, but really become determinants of who gets a high quality education and who's prevented 
Redlining was a practice during the 1930s, during the New Deal era. The government drew these maps showing who was or wasn't eligible for federal housing assistance. And so they would shade certain areas of the city green or blue, meaning that those areas were desirable and those people could get housing assistance. And then they shaded other areas of the city red or yellow. And those areas were not eligible for housing assistance. The government used the map to discriminate against people who lived in those areas. And what we found was that in many cases, the outline of the attendance zone kind of mirrors the shape of the desirable area from the redlining map from 80 years ago. This is really something that happens across the country. I believe that when readers pick up this book, that they will have this aha moment. There's so much that needs to be done to really change the system. But the first one is awareness. You can talk to parents of all different income levels who've had their lives affected by these policies. Poor minority parents who've been excluded from these elite public schools in the cities. Middle income parents who had to sell the home where they raised their kids. Wealthy parents in Malibu who've paid a friend for their utility bill. It's really extraordinary the lengths that people will go to navigate these policies. Have the courage to read this book and to understand that this is an opportunity. It's long past time to erase those lines. It's long past time to recognize them and dismantle them the same way we've taken on political gerrymandering and banking redlining. We've got to take on education redlining for every family that wants to have access to the American dream. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, I just think that's a good representation of what we're trying to do with the book. I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Jill. Okay. I have a hard question for you right off the bat. Page 51. Tim calls a school district in Chicago and fakes that he's a parent to try and he's trying to get into the good school. Tell us about that call. Once you realize that parents were lying to get into the good schools, making up addresses, and later in the book, and we'll get to this, being arrested, being followed and arrested for lying about their addresses so their kids could get into the better school just down the street. Tell us about that phone call to uh, Chicago. Yeah, so so we the book is based on these pairs of the, the 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 book is centered on these pairs of schools, right? Where there's one elite school and one failing school right next to each other, and they share an attendance zone boundary. And the pattern's the same in a lot of these cities, where you see that your destiny is determined by whether you're on one side of the of that line or the other. And people are paying significant premiums to live in the zone, in the privileged zone for the elite public school. And so what that does is it drives up real estate prices. And so the divisions, the social divisions grow over time because middle class people and lower income people can't afford those houses, can't necessarily afford those houses. And so, you know, we'd, we'd identified these schools, these pairs of schools. And, um, and one, the best example is in Chicago. There is a school called Lincoln Elementary, which is a very elite public school, one of the shining stars of the Chicago public schools. And then a mile away is a school called Menear Elementary. And so last year in 2019, 80%, over 80% of Lincoln students were proficient in reading. And then at the school a mile away, uh, the 0% of the eighth graders were proficient in reading um, last year. So, so anyway, so at a certain point I was like, well, I got to confirm what's going on here. So I just called the school and I said, I called Lincoln Elementary and I said, I want to, I want, you know, I'm moving to Chicago. I want to get my kid into your school. What do I have to do? And, and they confirmed, Hey, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta buy a house or rent an apartment in this zone. Right. Um, and if you're on the wrong side of the street, you don't have a chance of getting in. We are full up. And I did this with any number of schools across the country. In, in Seattle, the woman said, um, the person who answered the phone said, you better, get, you better buy a house in the right area. And I said, well, it doesn't really seem fair. Like there must be a way if I'm on the other side of the line. They said, well, she said, well, if we didn't have a line, no one would want to go to that other school, right? If we didn't draw a line, no one would want to go to that school. And I think that was very telling. So it's this is an American problem. We've got schools in New York, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Dallas, 
Los Angeles, San Francisco, the Bay Area, Seattle. This is, this is not unique to one area of the country. This is across the country. And Gloria, I'd love to ask, ask you a question because in the book, uh, Tim shows that some of the schools actually lie about having no seats. They don't want to let people know that they have any sort of a way to get in if you don't live there. And so they lie about the number of, of vacancies. And on page 59, he, uh, he, Tim gets into the fact that LAUSD says it only has two, I believe, two open seats out of 275,000 seats. Gloria, is that a real number? Uh, before I go into that, let me just say and, and thank the people who have joined us. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Tim, especially because today's historic. Today is the anniversary of Brown v. Board of Education, uh, but it's been 66 years. I mean, think about it with all deliberate speed and the pretext that was used for little Linda Brown not getting into uh, a good school. Uh, with skin color. Today, as Tim points out with the research and, and what I saw when I was serving in the legislature, it's about the lines that we don't even know exist. That's the issue that that they're out there. And how do we start explaining school A, school B, good schools, bad schools. But what I would see and what Tim saw over and over is that that chronically uh, kids get trapped into schools. So going back to the question that you raised, Jill, I don't know exactly what those numbers are. I don't know that I believe a whole lot of things that come out of LA Unified. But the issue is, is that they do the counting, they do the limiting, and they do these right or wrong in terms of the numbers that they give out to us based on arbitrary lines that the state allows or even mandates across the country for these lines to be drawn. And yet, some unelected bureaucrat deep in the bowels of you know of a boundary for LA Unified or any district across the country, they draw. You know, with, with political gerrymandering or other areas, we can see the lines. We've developed commissions to fight and dismantle those lines. But today, 66 years post Brown v. Board, they're lines that exist and we aren't even aware of them. And Tim, you called actually, you did such great research in this book and you contacted LA Unified, but not just them, many, many districts around the, the country and, and they were pretty open about uh, keeping kids out and LA USD said there's no way that they would tell how many open seats there are because there'd be a huge racket from people trying to get into the better schools. Well, the LA Unified didn't tell me that. That was a consultant. Um, no she consultant. A consultant who helps. Uh, these are consultants in many big cities um, who help um, families uh, get access to schools. If they're not zoned to a great school, that she these these consultants help them. And so w there's one here in LA who 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 made that comment that you know the, a lot of these schools are not full and um, they're not fully advertising the the open seats. Um, you know, one of the key things that we did um, uh, is at a certain point we started looking at you know the the analogy between these policies and the redlining practices as we said in the video uh, of the 1930s in which certain neighborhoods were discriminated against and and it you know it's all it's this is not a racial issue right there are people of all races living in those neighborhoods um and and, and um who are being kept out of these schools and if you look at um you know it was a big big moment when i said okay let me try to look at this old old map and let me try to superimpose the the redlining uh, the the current attendance zone for ivanhoe elementary in silver lake let me try to superimpose that on the the um, redlining map from the 30s and you know it's just surprising that those patterns still exist in many places brooklyn dallas um seattle indianapolis a uh, couple schools in la um and you just see these patterns where these 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 zone lines really seem to exclude areas that are um you know that have higher degree higher percentages of minorities and immigrants but there are many uh, Caucasian families living in those fa in those areas too that are boxed out of those of those schools. Um, and as you pointed out, Jill, you know, there's there's and Gloria is a great champion of these these people who've been tried 
for lying about their address. You know, lying about your address is something that goes on up and down the economic spectrum in America, right? Everyone does it. I've had certain people tell me, why are you even writing that book? Of course, everybody lies about their address to get access to a school. Well, the problem is, is that the only people being prosecuted are lower income people, right? I mean, we, you know, we know tons of people who, you know, if, I'm sure everyone on this, um, on this call knows people who've lied about their address. And it's just, it's very problematic. It sets up a dynamic, a dynamic where many districts um, surveil children, right? Um, we found an article uh, from Fraud Magazine, a PI posting about how to do surveillance on children. You know, make sure you've got a long lens so you can be far away. Make sure you have a, a female PI taking pictures because people freak out if they see a man taking pictures of children. And they're not, these policies set up a dynamic where they have to do that. And the people who are being surveilled are not just the people who are lying, right? The people who are being surveilled are, it's everybody, all the kids in that school. Um, it's, it's, it's a so problem. Fun. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about six, uh, page 65, where you were talking to Meredith Richards, a professor at Southern Meth Methodist University. And she studied attendance zones in Massachusetts, because all of the states have these redlining. And she found that the, the zones lead to a greater degree of racial separation than would have emerged if, if students had simply been assigned to the public school closest to their home. They're not going to the public school closest to their home. Yeah, well, that, I think that's that's the case in many in in many cases. It's not always the case, but it is the case um, oftentimes. And you know, some folks will say, "Well, hey, the school in that neighborhood, you know, in that area is going to be a little bit better no matter what." But what I would point out is in Chicago, right? If you look at North Avenue as the dividing line between Lincoln and Menier Elementary, and you have a thriving school, a, a star school versus a failing school. If you look at the health clinics in that neighborhood, right? There's a health clinic on the north side uh, of in that neighborhood, north of North Avenue, and there's a health clinic south of North Avenue. If you look at the patient ratings of those two health clinics, right, they're, they're about the same. And they're about the same because people are allowed to freely pass over North Avenue to go to whatever health clinic they want. So if one was failing, then people would go to the other one. And so they both have an incentive to serve and, and to, it, it just, there isn't the degree of separation of the community for the health clinics. And so you get better service and you get better levels of performance. Whereas the schools are kept separate. And as Gloria has pointed out, some of these schools have been failing for decades. They've been failing for decades. I want to pitch it over to Gloria for a moment. Um, on page 73 or 5, 75, I believe, um, uh, he gets into the issue of the anonymous tipsters in, in uh, parents in Michigan. Uh, parents are urged to tip off the school to tell on other parents, and it's creating this really sick system internally that nobody wants to talk about. You've been championing some of those families and kids. What's that all about, and what's that like to be, you know, basically we're spying on each other to so our kids don't get knocked out, but other kids don't, don't get allowed in. Absolutely, I, I know of several parents. Uh, Chicago, uh, outside of uh, outside of Chicago and Illinois, the Callahan family that basically uh, private investigator, others tipping off. Oh, there's somebody here who doesn't belong within these lines. The case of Hamlet Garcia in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, was absolutely incredulous and also involved, you know, some family strife. And so a way to get back at another family member is, oh, by the way, they are illegally residing in a in a line that where they don't exist. Now that didn't happen to be the case, but those were the stories that are told. So so what you point out is essentially uh, in, we've become essentially a society which in the effort to create, and, and, and I am going to say, uh, these function as apartheid systems, a means of basically putting up arbitrary fences and boundaries to keep people out, to prevent them from coming in, and then having the social enforcement. Some of the parents that we have been literally arrested, made to do the perp line, put into jail, kept there. Mr. Garcia was charged with a potential of staying in prison for up to seven years based on some of these false tips. It is real. It's happening. It needs to change. It, it clearly sounds out of control. I mean, it should be front page the LA Times. Um, Tim, can you go into a little bit um, what happened with Kelly Williams in Akron, Ohio? 
um, where the district hired a, a private investigator. Yeah, she was just a, a, a low-income mom who I think I think she was homeless, uh, and I think Gloria, Gloria, you know Kelly, right? Correct. Yeah, and and what I, I think she was homeless, and so the the district um, hired you know somebody to follow her and determined that um, her quote unquote home right wasn't in the district right wherever she was sleeping with her kids wasn't within the district lines and then they they put her in jail it's it's uh it's uh it's problematic and and, and we should make a point you know the, the, there are these two different types of lines right there are district lines which are the legislatively drawn lines saying these are the folks within these lines all of these people share a school right um and that that's one type of line. The other type of line are these attendance zones, which are, you know, they're kind of administrative service areas. They, they are lines drawn by the district. As Gloria says, we don't know how those lines get drawn. There's a, there's a lot of mystery about that. They do tend to get calcified over time because once you're in a zone, you will fight very, very hard. If you're in a zone for an elite school, you'll fight very, very hard if, if, if things change. If they try to change those lines, so um, one of the one of the things we found, I found these three examples, right? So Lincoln and Meniere is a great example. What happened in Chicago is young families started flooding into the Lincoln um, Lincoln attendance zone, and so Lincoln no longer had enough space. And so you'd think if Chicago public schools were a true public system where they were readjusting those lines based on um, changes in population. You'd expect what would happen, they'd change the lines to reflect where the kids live and some of those kids would be rezoned. But what happened instead is that they, those politically powerful parents were very upset. They went all the way up to the state, state the, the head of the state, the state Senate, and got, you know, $20 million in a, in a situation in which both the state and the city are, are in a financial crisis. They got $20 million to build a renovation to that elite school um, just so that their kids wouldn't be rezoned to these other schools. There were schools surrounding the Lincoln Elementary with hundreds of open seats, right? And so those schools are really not in the same system. Um, and it's, um, it's just very, very um, problematic, I think, um, for, um, for the allocation to work that way. And I think both you and Gloria have brought up a really interesting topic, which is that the community colleges stopped doing their redlining in 1987, and it was controversial, and every, any kid can go to any community college they want to drive to, essentially. And how's that working out? Yeah, t talk to us about that, Gloria. You're the one who brought that to my attention. Uh, the, the only place, I mean, if we stop and think about it, the only place where we use address is really in education and it's really K through 12 because in childcare, early childhood programs, parents aren't stopped at the front door saying, where are you from? Uh, community college, higher ed, uh, you can go to a private public university. You can go to, uh, think about it, you can worship at the temple or church of your choice. You can go to any dentist or doctor. You can go shopping in, well, maybe not today, but normally we, we do not use address. You know where, where you're from is used? Basically, that is the first question when you cross into gang territory, and then it's used in K through 12. So it is crazy. But let me also suggest to you as we start talking with the audience, sometimes people are afraid from, well, wait a minute, we pay our property taxes there. You know, we ought to be careful about this. I really assert, and Tim points out in the book, this should be a nonpartisan issue. There have been some in some areas of the country that have looked at what we call open enrollment, getting rid of the lines. In fact, it was uh, former Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia in one of his decisions, or you know, he was writing about this, and Tim, you can talk more about that, but talking about, wait a minute, why don't we try something like this? So I think when we look at this, this is not a left of center liberal idea when you have Justice Scalia raising this question as well, I think there's room, as Tim points out, because this affects all families across class, you know, working class, middle class lines overall. I think disproportionately there's especially a negative impact when high poverty children of color get chronically trapped in these underperforming schools. But this potential, this has the potential to unite families and communities to say that 
every kid deserves access and five degrees of separation, your zip code, and then your address within the same school district. Because it's not even about, that's a whole other issue when you look at between districts. But this is also when you're in the same district and you're paying these taxes overall to the same school district where they further track you and say, go to the left, not to the right. And as Tim pointed out, sometimes these schools are maybe within one mile apart, but vastly different outcomes. So I want us to think about the potential that can unite families, uh, right, left. It's about ensuring that with Brown v. Board of Education, that all kids, are entitled and have access, at least to the opportunity, to a quality school. And, yeah, wanna, and Tim gets into that. Um, we're gonna we're gonna go to the audience in about eight minutes. But Tim, can you talk about what you get into later in the book about some of the resolutions, including the EEOC and lawsuits, and where you're yeah, heading with this? I want to come back to one thing Gloria said about the community colleges. You know, the reason. So the, the California state legislature in the 80s passed a law saying it is not in the best interests of the people of the state of California that their enrollment be restricted to one community college, right? We want to open it up so that you can attend the community college of your choice. And the reason they did that, and the reason I think now is a hopeful moment, the reason they did that is because the community college system, which had been this pillar of educational opportunity, had been seeing declines in enrollment. And so they said, one way we can pull people back into this system, right, is by opening it up and giving people a choice so that, you know, if, you're, if the right program for you is over here versus over here, you've got a chance to do that. And what we're seeing today in the K-12 system in many, many big cities across the country, including Los Angeles, is, is dramatic declines in enrollment. Um, and I think, you know, people are moving out of the city in some cases or not having children even because they don't, they're not sure they can get a quality education for their kids um, without paying, you know, ridiculous amounts of money for private school. And, and so one way for the public K-12 education system to be more appealing to the parents and to appeal more and to pull people back in would be to have true open enrollment. Um, and one, one of the, one of the, one, the first big surprise I had when I, when I went, started researching this book was what was the basis for, keep, for, for a school turning people away who lived within walking distance? Well, in California, it's the open enrollment law. Right. So they passed a law in, in the 1990s that said, um, you know, any kid within a district has a right to go to any school in that district. Right. The problem is, is they added an exception which said, but you can't displace a kid who was zoned to go to that school to begin with. And and, you know, let's face it, that on the surface, that sounds extraordinarily reasonable. Right. As a way to run a system. But that exception created the geographic enrollment preference um, for, for people with wealth who could buy into the, to the zone. And so you, what you create is over time, the conditions for the schools to grow even more separate over time as the real estate goes up and the population of those schools goes, um, um, go in different directions. And so you, you know, the, the divisions are created by that law. So, so as Jill says, um, one big component of what I was looking at is, you know, what are the laws that govern attendance zones? And so there were two big surprises. Um, one big surprise was that there is this long forgotten uh, 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 law called the Civil Rights Law from the 70s called the Equal Educational Opportunities Act. And I write about this law uh, just this week, Education Next, the magazine Ed Education Next published an excerpt up from the book. Um, in which I talk about this law. This law um, puts constraints on what, how districts can assign kids to schools and what they can and can't do. And it, 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 the language is very, very clear. And the, the attendant zones of these elite public schools in the inner cities are in violation of this federal civil rights law. So the, the law says that minority kids cannot be assigned to a, uh, to a public school that is not the nearest to their residence if it enhances segregation. The idea being districts can't play with their zones to direct minority kids um, away from the, the, the schools uh, with a higher degree, a higher concentration of Caucasian students. 
And so, you know, these, these attendance zones are weird misshapen things. And so there are lots of pockets where you find that are in violation of, of this federal civil rights law. And um, I think there's a lot of excitement about the idea of challenging some of these and using the lawsuit to change the lines, but also to draw attention to this issue. Um, secondly, as you stated, as Gloria stated, I'm digging around in the civil in the civil rights rulings from the, the from the Supreme Court, and I found this amazing quotation from Justice Scalia, where he says, "You know, it, we could have done this differently, right? Um, uh, we we could have opened up all of the schools." He, he imagines a system in which parents are free to disregard their neighborhood school assignment and can send their kid to any school within the district, um, and. It's a very powerful passage because he's he's pointing out that the 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 Supreme Court's approach to to um, to segregation um, in the schools the only thing that the Supreme Court has outlawed is overt segregation. So over time, um, what's happened is that districts have removed any mention of overt segregation, racial segregation, in you know in their public statements, in their policy documents, and everything else. But the fact is, is that a district can run schools, and many districts do, that are very, very segregated on racial lines and along income lines. They can do that all they want. And the, the Supreme Court has declared itself, uh, you know, hands up, we can't do anything about that. Scalia was pointing out, well, if, if what we were talking about was access, if we said, hey, we want to guarantee, e guarantee equal racial access to schools, um, that rather than trying to to uh, eradicate overt segregation, then then the the courts would have an active ongoing role to play in making sure that the public schools are open to the public. And and you know it was surprising. I don't think very many people know about that opinion. And it, it's it's you know he, he Scalia was a great writer, and and he he would on occasion. Um, take counterintuitive views. And I, I just, it's its an astounding opinion. So I recommend that everyone take a look at that. Tim, Tim you're prompting some questions in the um, ask a question area down at the bottom of the screen. And I'll read you one of them. Um, my interest is piqued by the litigation strategies covered in the book. For community members and advocates, what effective steps and measures should we plan to take together? Yeah, so I think, um, well, if, if you know, I've had a couple of lawyers talk to me about the Gloria and I've actually talked to a couple of lawyers over the years about these issues. Um, and so if you're interested in filing a lawsuit, definitely reach out to us. Um, you can find our emails very easily on, well, you can find my email on my website. Um, and it's not hard to find um, Tim at Tim And um, you know, I think, one of the things we've been contemplating, I've been talking, I was talking to um, uh, Citizen Stewart, who's a very prominent African-American voice uh, for ed, ed reform. Uh, I talked to him on his daily broadcast this week about the book, and, and we're, we're talking about potentially launching protests of some of these elite schools um, and saying, hey, we have to open up these schools to, to people who live within walking distance of the school, right? And so we're thinking about some protests. We're, we're obviously going to keep writing about these issues. And um, the, the lawsuit angle is one I think that both Gloria and I are very excited about. And so it's a matter of finding the right venue and finding the right opportunity to do something like that. Julie, Great. Now, one last question, um, Gloria. Um, and then I guess we're going to go to the audience. And that was, um, how do you see distance learning affecting the failing school interpretation? Okay. Uh, distance learning, again, too, it varies by district. Once again, I think you can take a look at one school district, take a look at another. They're completely different because we've, we've of course, determined that um, you know, any type of educational program is, of course, local based. Having said that, I think that there are great possibilities there as well. And let me go back to just the question overall. I, I don't think any of us are saying or concluding that it's okay to say these are the great schools and these are the failing schools and we want the, the kids in the identified because the state of California identifies. I used to see the list. So, you know, I would see the list of these are failing. They didn't call them failing schools. There was more bureau, bureaucratic language, but they're failing schools. So what we're concluding overall is it's not that we want to be happy by saying, OK, let's flee the bad school and get into the goal. Ultimately, 
we should look at uh, at ensuring that every school has a you know uh, is prioritized to have a high quality education you got to take on teachers contracts teacher training uh, resources i mean there's a number of issues but in the meantime clearly we see that this occurs so it's it's the issue of making sure that there's the access there i think that distance learning online education i would submit to you that post pandemic there's probably going to be a lot of families that are saying i'm not going back to la unified or i'm not going back to santa ana unified i'm happy with homeschooling i'm happy with some remote distance learning i'm happy with other alternatives there are some families i've heard about albeit these are more affluent parents in New York that are actually kind of developing a consortium to essentially say, we're gonna create our own little like mini quote unquote neighborhood schools and have our own teachers, et cetera. So there's a lot of ways though that parents are thinking about it. At the end of the day, you know, I believe in school choice. You know, I'm a Democrat that says I'm pro-choice and that includes education. And so there's not one glove that fits all. It's what does a family think that is best for that child. But I think that it's important though that whatever that entity is, that it's of quality and that it's not bound by a certain line that says, if you don't have this income or you don't live in this neighborhood or you don't live in these new lines, that you just don't have access. You know, if I can say that, you know, we always put out the word, oh, you know, education is the kid of the American dream. And, you know, and I believe it. We say it over. We've been saying it for 66 years. But what Tim's book points out is that what we know, what's so cynical is that too many kids in America have been given keys to that front door that just won't turn. And that is, I think, is what part of the aha moment is in Tim's book, is that these kid, these keys don't turn the lock. And we want to turn a lock. Let's just kind of change it. But you got to look at the lines and then alternatives. You know, one thing that we haven't touched on yet uh, um, is that, uh, Tim, you put a, a couple of maps in the book of your own neighborhood, which I thought was very, very brave. What made you do that? Um, well, partly it's just knowledge, right? My, you know, these are issues that I was interested before I'm interested in before I moved to this neighborhood. But the this neighborhood um, has dramatic, you know, the, these in, these issues are directly relevant to where we live, right? Where my family lives, um, and so the, in in Mount Washington, there's a very there's an elite public school, one of the most coveted schools in in LA Unified, and the the shape of there's an attendance zone, and and the shape of that zone is very weird, right? And I would absolutely love to have you know the you know how did that line get drawn over time? Um, I would love to know that, and if it, it correlates, you know, if you look at the red lining red lining map of our neighborhood from the 1930s, right, which is almost 100 years ago now, it, it the, the shape of the quote unquote desirable area is very, very similar to the shape of our attendance zone today, right? And then, and then we looked very closely at the EEOA. So we did a video, a great video of, of the, the, the EEOA analysis of which, which families might be able to file a lawsuit in federal court saying, hey, we have, a, we have a right under federal law to an equal opportunity to apply to this school and we're being excluded. And so we did that analysis for this school partially because the, the, the Mount Washington attendance zone is just so weird um, that it, it, it raises those EEO, it, it poses those EEOA questions really, really effectively. Um, and, you know, I, I don't mind. I mean, I think most of my neighbors are aware of these issues. Um, I will say, Part of this book is meant. I, I I have an instinct to I have an instinct to see the best in people and to assume good intentions, right? Um, and so I never want to claim that somebody who disagrees with me. I know this this is a hard pill to swallow for some folks, and I and I want to acknowledge that that it, it's not easy. And this assumption that where you live drives where you go to school is a very big one. And 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 certainly I have young kids. Proximity, finding a good school that is close to our house is extremely important to me. So what I am not saying is that your kid should be assigned to another school on the opposite side of town. 
What I'm saying is that your, your kid should not be assigned to any school, right? Why, why should the district, like why, why should a bureaucrat determine where your kid goes to school? The, the bureaucrat, your bureaucrats never met your kid, right? The bureaucrat has no idea where you live. The bureaucrat who drew those lines probably has never set foot in the school that they drew the lines for. They've never met your kid. How in the world would that person know what's the right thing for your kid? So, and, and, and the, the stats, right? So the stats published by the federal government show that over 50% of people um, in America just send their kid to whatever school they've been assigned to, right? And the, the, rest, the other 45% is made up of people who buy a house in order to gain access to a school they wanna go to. It's made up of people who choose uh, forms of public school choice. It's made up of people who choose private schools or homeschool. But 55% of the people are just going where the bureaucrat tells them to go. And I, I, would, I don't think, I think people up and down the economic spectrum should really think carefully about whether they want to just trust the government on this big question of who you're entrusting your kids with. Um, so, oh, and so I, I did want to follow up. So if, if, you, if you find yourself buying a house in, in one of these areas and getting access to a school, and then you find yourself saying, well, I'm, 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 I'm pro open enrollment. Like I believe in open enrollment, but I really like this exception, right? That gives my kids a privileged access to this school. Um, and then you find yourself also arguing that, well, I don't really like charter schools, right? Like I don't want the kids, I want the kids who are outside of the zone, I want them to go to their own school and I don't want them to have other choices. If you combine those three sets of opinions, and I think those three sets of opinions are commonly held together, I have a very hard time. And again, I wanna see the best in people. I have a very hard time seeing how that is a morally righteous uh, position, right? And, I, and what I'm trying to do with this book is just, I think a lot of people have not been paying attention and they, they don't really think these things through very well. And what I'm trying to do with the book is just say, hey, let's all stare this thing stare at this thing straight on like like what is really going on here let's look at it straight on and i think once you do that i think it's hard to support these these kinds of policies we have a good question for you on that on that topic um, if kids can go to any school you would still discriminate wouldn't you against those who can't provide transportation um, and many school districts don't provide anything, so there'd still be an e economic and racial divide. That is true. If you, if you look at Scalia's, uh, Scalia's opinion, he says uh, um, the district should pay, right? If, if a kid wants to go to a different school in the district um, that's a better school, that the district should pay for that, 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 that transportation for that child. And I would certainly, you know, I think you could have some partial subsidiz subsidization of, 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 of transportation. You know, I was talking to Tony Miller, the um, the deputy, the former deputy secretary of that under President Obama, who's a friend. And he said, well, one thing you could do is you could just say, well, the district will provide transportation for any school within a five mile radius. Right. And then if you want to get your kid to a school outside that zone, you have every right to a, to to attend a school outside that radius. But then you got to get your kid there. Like maybe you have a job over in that part of town. Then great. You get them there then they have as much of a right to go to that school as anyone else in that district. Anyway. You know, one of, the things you, one of the things you phrase you used at, at the very end of the book, um, Tim, is you call this the unfinished project that began 66 years ago. And that goes back to... The, yeah, the, the anniversary of Brown v. Board of Ed. Exactly. I mean, it's really... I think a lot of people just assume that the schools are open, that the public schools are open to the public, and they, you know, because of these policies, um, they they really aren't. The vast majority of people are are boxed out of these schools. Um, they're really these policies are really only helping a very narrow set of people, and and I would argue even those people, I don't think in the long run, right? It's it's driving up property prices, and I think the government has done a, a series of policies over the past 10 years to prop up poly, pop, uh, property prices. And I, I, that's not what we want, right? We want our kids to be able to afford housing, right? We don't want exorbitant housing prices. And I think this is one of the ways, it's a separate issue, but it's one of the ways that the government props up prices. Um, and Tim, I, I guess one of the questions that is kind of a thread through all of this is, um, 
it, if you can open all the schools like this, and if parents can move their kids all over the place, what will happen to the quality of schools? Will they even up? Like, will the bad schools get better? Um, I think they will. Gloria, do you want to talk about that? <laughs> Well, if you think about it, I mean, to some extent, the creation of magnet schools, even the creation of charter schools, to some extent, it was intended to do a healthy competition with the idea being that, you know, uh, that all boats rise. So I think that is the case overall, that you find overall, when you find good quality charter schools or magnets, the idea is to make sure that there is a betterment. As I had said earlier, it's not like we say we want to just flee and then leave the bad schools there it's really an opportunity to say, let's turn it around. Let's make sure that we get what the standards are. You have to address a lot of issues related to staff and teaching and leadership. There's a lot of things there. I mean, the Williams lawsuit, in terms of even, do you have rats in the kitchen and what do the bathrooms look like? All of that is part of it, I think. So, so I think overall, the, the goal is to make sure that you have this, but this is a leading way in which, you know, with open enrollment ideas, there's different ways to do this, but to basically say you leave no school behind. And for those schools that don't make the change, I was always of the premise that you shut it down. It's a school building. This is about kids and education. And as we've seen now with the pandemic, we can go virtual. We can go other ways uh, and we can lie our close, way out. Close it down and then reopen it, right? Um, exactly. You know, I, I would come back to that example of the two health clinics, right? In Chicago, right? You've got those two, you've got the vast difference in the schools separated by this artificial line created by the government. Um, but the health clinics, the health clinics are both high performing on each side of the line because everyone's mixing and everyone is fully invested. And if a health clinic fully failed, um, they would close it down and, and the doctors and nurses would go find a job at a different health clinic and there'd be an opportunity there. I, I think there's, um, I just think it sets up the dynamic. Uh, and I, I also think that the, the folks who've bought a house in in the Lincoln zone right now or in the Mount Washington zone, they are not invested in making the, the system better overall or in making the failing schools better. They, they've found a way around. And I think if you um, really um, put them in the same boat as everyone else and say, hey, you have to enter a lottery to get into this school, then there is gonna be a lot more pressure from those politically powerful parents to make the other schools better because they're gonna want other options if they can't be guaranteed access to, to an elite school. So they're gonna they're gonna want other options. Everyone will be in the same boat together. And I think that's more healthy for our democracy. Um, there was a great question and just disappeared actually, asking about um, how would it phase in? I mean, what if uh, what if the good schools get overwhelmed? How do you see it unfolding? Um, well, the, the good schools are already overwhelmed, right? Um, it's already overwhelmed. They're already overwhelmed. They always, they already get way too many applicants. Um, some people don't even apply because they know that they can't get in. Um, um, I think what would happen over time is you, you know, it would create dramatically more demand for educational pluralism, right? So different options, different types of schools and better schools. So I think it create more pressure, but there would, I mean, there's no, there's no question that it, it, they would create a little, you know, in the near term, there'd be a little bit of friction, but I think, um, people would respond to that. And I think they'd respond in a positive way. So let's talk about taxes. One of the questions, if you're going to ask the schools to provide the transportation, um, are, is the public going to be willing to pay taxes on that? Um, Gloria, you have any thoughts? <laughs> As if we're not paying right now. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's always again, follow the money, et cetera. It's important to point out that almost half the California state budget is uh, on education. And I would submit to you, take a look at the outcomes now. I don't know that most people are even happy with this. So if it is about taxes, then let's have the conversation. How do we want to go forward? In fact, with the governor's uh, proposal, uh, I actually think too, I mean, you know, when there's crisis, there's opportunity. Uh, let's take a look at how we do things. I mean, maybe we have to rethink how we even pay for this, but it's always the questions but right now, 50% almost of the state budget, we're not getting what we are paying for. So let's think about how we change that. I, I think would, it, I looking at the last initiative that was voted down in Los Angeles, it sho didn't shock me. 
it shocked a lot of people who were so certain that, oh, people always vote for taxes. Taxpayers and families are stepping up and saying, no, you know, times are tight. We're not just going to pay for stuff anymore, but give me something of quality. Give me something that transforms many neighborhoods so that we all get some essentially skin in the game and I get something out of it. I think there's opportunities for bigger coalitions rather than just, you know, the chosen few. Sorry, Tim, I interrupted you. Yeah, no worries. I, I also think if, if, if people really, um, are, if it's full open enrollment, the vast majority of people are going to pick schools that are close in proximity to their home. And there might be some people who say, oh, well, there, here's another school that's close in proximity to where I work. So I'll drop my kids off over there. That's a better school. But the, the vast majority of people are going to prefer a school close to their home. And, and, and you know, where I live here in Mount Washington, there, there are many, many schools, right, that, that uh, are, are, are within three miles or five miles of my house. And so, you know, there are many options. It's just the, the, the best schools just aren't available to most people. Well, I think this might be the last question. I'm not sure on our timing here, but um, somebody would like to know um, from either one of you, your ideal alternative system that would take place if there weren't attendance zones, would it be a lottery or first come first serve or how would you do it? Yeah, I would read, um, so just today, uh, uh, Jay Matthews in the Washington Post published this column about our book and he talks about lotteries. I'm a big fan of, you know, experimentation. And so I would just say, if we could just say, hey, you can't use zip code. Within a zip code, you I mean, sorry, with that, within a district, you can't use zip code. Some school districts would experiment with a centralized lottery, right? Some school districts, districts might experiment with school site lotteries like charter schools use. Others might use first come, first serve. I, all of those systems have are, are not perfect. They have lots of potential for abuse. But all of those systems are at least based on the principle of equality of opportunity, right? Our, our current system isn't even based on the principle of equality of opportunity. So it starts from a corrupt place and then it's further corrupted by people, you know, trying to get what's best for their kids. I think we should start with a system that, with, that starts with equality of opportunity. And I, I'd like to see districts have some flexibility to design different systems. Let's see what works if geogra geography is outlawed. Um, how do you deal with the teachers union? I guess I'll ask Gloria and that's the last question. You know, this is something where I think there's an opening. You know, when I wrote one of the first open enrollment laws, one of the first uh, looking at this, um, I reached out to UTLA. It was then headed by AJ Duffy. The union came out and said, no, no, we're, I mean, like, we're, education is going to go to hell in a handbasket. But you know what he did, though? He actually stepped aside. He said, you know what, Gloria? We can do this. Remember, Tim pointed out earlier, we have declining enrollment. The unions hate charter schools. You know how to want to, if you want to put charter schools out of business, quite frankly, I'll work with you on that. Basically, adopt some of these open enrollment. That's essentially the argument, the business plan, if you dare say it, of a charter school. It gives parents choice, giving families choice to break zip code that allows you to transgress a border, a fine line that somebody in the past drew. That's actually, I think, good. So if Alex Caputo Pearl or somebody from UTLA is listening, Tim and I, we'd love to talk with you because, as I said before, this shouldn't be a left or right issue. There's a real winning issue that allows kids, families, education to succeed. It's the American dream. Why would we oppose it? <laughs> That's a great note to end on. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And there's the book there. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much, Jill, Gloria, Tim. Uh, we Romans really appreciate you. Um, having this incredible discussion that uh, the community can be a part of and engage in. We had a lot of great questions as well. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, the book that Gloria is holding right there can be purchased through the Romans Bookstore website by clicking on that green button down uh, underneath us where it says buy a fine line. Click on that, that'll take you to our website and you can uh, uh, shop around if you'd like and, uh, and, and buy it there. Um, so, uh, I want to thank everybody for supporting independent bookstores during this very important time. Uh, and um, once again, uh, these great folks, uh, thank you for being a part of this. Please follow Romans on Crowdcast and uh, you can subscribe to our newsletter for other great events like this. Uh, 
Any, any other last words, folks? Thank you so much. Thank you, thank, thank you to All Romans. Right. And thank, thank you, Jill and Gloria. Fantastic. Thanks for joining. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you.